And uh, immediately I would like to invite Professor Leszek Balcerowicz from Warsaw School of Economics, but of course he has many titles, uh, very respectable titles, uh, uh, dating back to early 90s, uh, reform architect, uh, uh, most of well-known reformists in, in Central Eastern European countries, uh, uh, head of the Central Bank of Poland, uh, working for the government, uh, and what is uh, also very relevant for our conference until this spring, uh, advising President Poroshenko on economic and institutional reforms in Ukraine. So we are very interested to hear your insights, uh, Leszek, and if I may ask uh, to target 20 minutes for your talk, approximately, so that after both keynote speeches we would have uh, about 15 or so minutes for Q&A session. I'm sure there will be questions. So the floor is yours, Leszek. Thank you very much for the invitation. <coughs> I just wanted to suggest that I share my 30 minutes <coughs> with you, which means uh, I should turn 2 to 11. And I will divide my presentation in two parts. First, a few general remarks, and then more specific uh, on Ukraine. <coughs> we are speaking about reforms. <coughs> we are speaking about a change from a hopefully good change from a bad system to a better one. <laughs> there may be a reverse. Now, so one has to start saying a few words about the systems. This is a huge subject. But let me say I am using <coughs> four measurable and very important criteria in distinguishing types of the systems. First, the mechanism of succession. Rulers die. So you have either democracy, meaning an open competition, which requires the second variable. This is the extent of civil rights. The third extremely important variable is the level of the rule of law. And fourth is the extent of economic freedom. And all of this is now measured by Fraser, by indices of Fraser Institute, Freedom House, Business, etc., etc. I advise you to use this. Because then you see different types of institutional systems. At the one extreme, you have regimes or systems which display a high level of the rule of law, democracy, extensive civil rights, and extensive economic freedom. That's a very rare combination. On the few countries come close to that nowadays. On the other extreme, you have the worst system, which is socialism. If you love the word socialist, you can call it communism. But remember, <laughs> that a dominating feature was a ban on private ownership and market, meaning deprivation of people of economic freedom. And once you introduce this and want to maintain this, you have to deprive people of democracy and civil rights, and you have to intimidate them, which means the rule of law is very low. And what you need? KGB. So this is the essence. This was extremely bad system, which was based on fear, on intimidation, and it had a very bad economic results, uh, even though there were many, many dreams. So the collapse of the system was one of the most fortunate events in the world history. And after this collapse, there were many different transitions, which I am not going to discuss. No, but there were two problems. First, economic of transition, meaning what target system do you aim at? And second, how do you make the transition? Now, not every government knew where to head, because you need a little knowledge, comparative knowledge. But it was not very difficult to see that the system which displays high rev level of rule of law, extensive economic freedom, extensive civil rights, and democracy is the best among real life systems. And the second one about the speed of transition. There was a lot of confusion. A nonsensical juxtaposition like shock therapy versus, versus gradualism. Where's the nonsense? But one could think and know that uh, if you have uh, such a bad system at the beginning, 
the best strategy is to move fast and vast. Fast and vast, which means radical therapy. And I am happy that Poland at the beginning, then our friends, the Baltic countries, more, more or less, and there are huge, huge differences among countries depending on the target system and depending on the speed of reforms. But even countries which delayed radical transition can catch up, like Slovakia, under, after major, etc. So there's still hope on certain conditions. And political economy deals with factors which determine what is your target system and what is the speed and structure of the transition. <clears throat> My second general or third general point is this. There are various combinations of situational and personal factors which determine the type, the timing of transition. I am not going to it. I think one should distinguish between dictatorships among the initial conditions and non-dictatorship, pluralistic, because in dictatorship you cannot appeal to a civil society using domestic media. But what is needed then? more free Europe. I am amazed that so little is done with respect to the societies which are under dictatorship. It is technically possible. In countries when you fortunately don't have dictatorships, you can appeal to civil society using the free media and it should be done and much more strongly and in a coordinated way. Much more work can and should be done on that. Now, uh, as I said, there is a situation. Uh, what sort of policies or reforms are being uh, pursued depends on this combination of situational and personal factors. And I would distinguish two polar cases. Very bad economic situation, call it crisis. Then sometimes even bad guys, anti-reformers, do reform. And here is the role for external factors then. But this has to be very well coordinated and persistent, very well focused. I can mention from my experience in Ukraine that that was not always the case. And for example, one of the lagging reforms, land reform, was subject to different uh, pressures from different international institutions. And the World Bank was rather conservative of that. That's enough, usually, not to have a reform, if there is a strong domestic resistance. And the second situation is improving situation. That's very dangerous for reforms. If situation is improving, especially is dangerous if improvement is due not to previous reforms, to witful gains. Then you need a very good team, not to waste. Not to waste these windfall gains, but to pursue reform, despite improving economic situation, because improving situation may be fragile. I am coming to that. Even more mobilization, even better coordination of external actors is needed in such a situation. Which, uh, and if situation improves, you need a new set of incentives with respect to <coughs> the policy makers, which may be reformers, they would like to do, but may they feel they are constrained by some anti-reformers. So you need, you need a new incentives uh, like Kubilo's plan. <laughs> but this has to be strictly conditioned. And it has to be communicated to the society and not to the president behind the closed doors. Because the logic is not that, that you persuade the president who thinks otherwise or thinks, oh, I have my op domestic opponents, I would not risk. Such plans should serve to mobilize the domestic population, civil groups, to pressure the politicians to reform, not only the government, but the opposition, which in uh, Ukraine is worse. They are more populist. And so, communicating a good plan to the population is extremely, extremely important. And strict conditionality.
persistent, professional, and strong. <clears throat> this brings me to the second part, Ukraine, where I was asked by the President Poroshenko, uh, some, there were different proposals, finally I uh, suggested to him that I would be ready to create a group of what was called strategic advisors. There are too many advisors in Ukraine, and they do not coordinate well. <laughs> so I did not want to add to confusion. This is why there was an idea that I will pick up advisors. I asked my younger colleague, Ivan Miklos from Slovakia, to be my co-chairman of the group, which was called SACSUR, Group of Strategic Advisors. And the idea was that we would try to prevent bad measures having access to the proposals and push good matters, having access to all top policymakers. So I was acting for a year until April this year, and I was meeting not only the president, the prime minister, leaders of the, par of the parties, etc., etc. Everybody was for reform. <laughs> I haven't met open Open opponents of reform, but with the reforms there were various uh, stories. I was 50 times in Ukraine, I do not regret. I am not saying that we make a tremendous contribution, but probably we did not make things worse. And I was communicating with civil society in Ukraine, with the media, etc., etc. <clears throat> now, looking with a bird's eye, <clears throat> not about uh, my activity or success ones, but about Ukraine. <clears throat> 2014, there was a tragic economic and non-economic situation in Ukraine, and this should be always remembered. Economic situation, Ukraine was condemned, regardless of policies, to have a deep, deep crisis, a collapse in the economy. There was no policy which could prevent it. Why? First, there was a legacy of Yanukovych, very expansionary policy without reforms or very little reforms. And second, consequences of Putin's aggression. And I am speaking not only about military aggression, I am speaking about economic aggression, a ban on exports. If Germany blocked Polish exports, we would have a collapse of the economy. So it was even worse, so it was unavoidable to have a decline in GDP exceeding 10%, 14%, etc. Against this background, one should be amazed by the success of stabilization effort in Ukraine, meaning avoiding the explosion of the budget deficit and the corresponding hyperinflation. The contrary, the opposite has happened, and they slashed the budget deficit from above 10% to 3%, Why massively increasing the military spending. This is the world record. They avoided the collapse of the banking sector. And here a brave lady, Mrs. Gontarieva, <laughs> deserves a lot of praise, and they, to some extent, cleaned up the banking sector. Of course, there is a new problem, the private bank. I may, may come to that, but uh, well, I cannot praise enough the achievements in stabilization. This is not recognized enough, I think, in the West. Western countries have problems by cutting budget deficit by half a percentage point. <laughs> we have problems in Poland. <laughs> and Ukraine, they reduce it by 10 percentage points while suffering deep, deep recession. There is a deep, deep, uh, mixed record on structural reforms, which are the key for economic growth and for maintaining the stability. <clears throat> and very, very briefly, and a bit subjectively, I would uh, list four categories <laughs> speaking about reforms. First, bright spots, encouraging starts, modest starts, no start. <laughs> I give you an example. I think the brightest spot is gas sector, which was an uh, enclave of huge corruption and the related gains, like uh, cutting dependence on Russian gas, 
rationalizing it. This has to be finished, but I think it was very, very important. New team. Encouraging starts, I think, this judicial reform, which needs implementation. I speak about the legal framework. Electronic declaration as a tool to clean up uh, corruption. Creating new institutions, very important, <clears throat> like NABU, like uh, bu business ombudsman, by the way, heading by the very good Lithuanian guy, very good one. <laughs> and he is doing quite a good, uh, I think in, uh, to some extent railways started to be restructured. A modest beginning, which means there's a lot of room to do. It's a regula deregulation. It has done, but much remains to be done. Demonopolization is extremely important because it also involves reducing the power of the oligarchs. So instead of fighting directly, one should uh, identify the monopolies or vested interest and have a comprehensive program. There's a good guy who has modest resources. So the conclusion is to strengthen him. I can give some confidential information later. <laughs> local government, local government. A modest beginning needs to be speeded up. And no stunts, pretty amazing, no privatization. Even though it's so obvious <laughs> that one can increase productivity by privatizing, including massive small enterprises, land reform. Ukraine is, I think, on the along uh, Belarus, Belarus, the last country. And now one would need a more deep uh, political economy analysis to say why some reforms have progressed, why other reforms have been blocked, have not started, they don't have time and don't enough knowledge. <coughs> My sector, my final remarks would be this. Thanks to massive stabilization and some reforms, some important reforms, Ukraine started to grow. And that's very important. But the growth is modest. Two, three percent. It's not for a country which has to so, much, so many reserves in a sense that if you reform more, you would search ahead. Secondly, if you look at the growth factors at the first order, approximate, then you see employment, private investment and productivity growth. Now, given demography, employment is falling, and to prevent a further fall, pension reform is absolutely needed. And the only sensible solution to pension reform is making people work longer if they retire at a very low age. You may do it in various ways, openly or not openly, but what counts is the result. <laughs> but Ukraine cannot count on increases in employment. It's rather facing declines in employment, which is bad for economic growth. But you, cannot, you can mitigate this, but you cannot change it radically plus migration. In Poland we are enjoying a lot <laughs> Ukrainian immigrants. Second, private investment is too low and private investment depends on business environment, on uncertainty, on corruption, etc. Et so the key reforms of the state are also the key reforms for private investment. And they need to be implemented, finished and protected. And finally, productivity growth which is related to private investment. This is the ultimate and most important engine. And productivity growth enormous, depends enormously on the kind of the system, extent of civil rights, but first of all, extent of economic freedom, which should be equally protected. What is chronic capitalism? It is a system whereby a group enjoys very high protection. And including the possibility to rob other entrepreneurs, Putin system. Uh, I think Ukraine is making progress on eradicating, but the key to growth <coughs> is extensive and equally protected economic freedom. This is also about <coughs> equality of opportunity in economic life. So this 
So I am saying that I like to convey the message that finishing the key reforms is crucial for increasing productivity and private investment, which in terms is crucial for economic growth. <clears throat> what about external assistance? Very important. Well, as I said, new incentives, very well targeted, very well communicated. Civil society is lively in Ukraine, very good. That's a contrast between Moscow and uh, Russia and Ukraine. But I think and I try to encourage the best uh, think tanks to coordinate a little, to help. It should be an alliance of uh, civil society and external institutions to focus on the mo most important. Then the pressure and the communicating the perils of blocking reforms. And also I think civil society should stop criticizing only the government because opposition is worse. So if you criticize only the government, you are promoting worse opposition. So look, criticize measures, criticize blockade of reforms and focus on the whole uh, political system. <clears throat> Ukraine, it's no need to say how important is Ukraine. Not only for Ukraine, even though it's so important, a large nation in Europe, which, in, which for the first time has such a long period of independence. This is the longest period. But it is extremely important for this new better order in Europe. So we need to protect and encourage and pressure, if necessary, the actors in Ukraine to press with reforms, not only for themselves, but also for us. Thank you very much.